what were your key takeaways looking at, you know, on one side, the ugliness and the shockingly horrific nature of the, the scale of job losses? And on the other, you know, the fact that the, the mar- it didn't really change the tone in financial markets. You know, it really is interesting. I still get this sense that many investors are sort of whistling by the COVID graveyard, and that really is disturbing. What I really see in these numbers, even though we saw that really high number, almost 79%, 78.3% were on temporary layoff, I don't think all those workers are going to be able to be called back. We will see some call back with the payroll protection plan loans, which last for eight weeks Um, and cover eight weeks of salary. But that, again, puts us in July with another round of layoffs. There's no way that many of these that are hardest hit in the food services industry, leisure and hospitality, even healthcare and education are going to be able to, and retail, are going to be able to come back to the level of activity that they did prior to the crisis, especially over the summer and as we get into winter months, given that we'll still be social distancing. Also, many large employers have pulled back and are having workers continue to work from home right through the summer months until the fall. That's going to mean no one's downtown in these downtown areas to go to restaurants, even though they can only open partially over the summer. And then you've got the additional hit of many companies have canceled meetings and pulled back on travel through year end, which is much of the leisure and hospitality industry really relies Mm. upon. So although these are temporary layoffs, I fear about how many of these will become much more permanent over the summer months, even if we get a temporary reprieve in response to the PPP loans over the next two months. So, so what happens when those PPP loans run out, because there is an expiration date, and when the expanded <coughs> unemployment benefits that were part of the CARES Act also run out? Then what does this economy look like? Well, then it's even more disastrous. We've already seen food lines in the miles. We know that the um, SNAP, the, what were once called food stamps, are not did not get included in the CARES Act. And so you're talking about a much higher level of unemployment and economic pain than what we see in the overall economic numbers and much less aid. And I think that's something that we need to see Congress focusing on now is to not sort of wait and see what's going to happen. We need to be preemptive because we do know that the unemployment um, expansions to furloughed workers, gig workers, and the self-employed, that needs to be extended over the summer. And that's something that they need to start doing and thinking about now because that expires in July, right around the time not only we see those PPP um, loans expire and layoffs pick up from there, but also layoffs at the state and local level, which were already extraordinarily large, two-thirds in education, almost a million jobs lost there in the last month. Those are going to really hit hard over the summer in education and first responders if we don't see transfers to the state, because many state and local governments start their fiscal year on July 1st. So I'm very worried about the need for continued aid and relief out there and then a stimulus bill on the other side of it. And I'm hopeful that Congress will come up with something. I'm worried they won't come up with enough and they'll wait too long. Meanwhile, Diane, uh, people were uh, raising their eyebrows at Fed Funds Futures yesterday, uh, the prospect of negative rates. Now Kevin Hassett's on the tape this morning saying that if the Fed does decide to go there, uh, he would support it, although he he reiterated that the the Fed has independence. How much of, of that is on your radar this week? You know, it's really interesting. Um, Actually, um, the president of the Philadelphia Fed did a speech at the Council on Foreign Relations, the Chicago Council, yesterday, and it was fabulous. And he addressed directly the issue of negative rates and said how inappropriate it would be to do negative rates in response to this particular crisis. There may be, and he has a very high threshold for negative rates down the road in response to a more normal recession, but he couldn't see anything about how negative rates would reopen businesses that literally closed as a result of this. And one of the things the Fed is worried about is the number of bankruptcies we see over the next year and how much consolidation we see, and negative rates don't change that equation. The Fed also used, um, looked at negative rates as part of their review on what they would use as tools going forward, and negative rates were very low on the list because their efficacy abroad has been very limited and very mixed bag, and and especially in the United States, they could have a particular blow 
to the banking system and money market funds. So this really does not look like the best tool for the Fed to use. They have other tools. And there was a plea by um, the Philadelphia Fed that really echoed Jay Powell's plea to Congress for more fiscal stimulus and more not actually stimulus relief is how he termed it, which I think is where we need to go. Hmm. Uh, let's bring in Brent Schutte this morning as well, uh, Diane, uh, Chief Investment Strategist at Northwestern Mutual Financial Management. Uh, Brent, Diane's been talking about, um, obviously, horrific jobs numbers, hit to purchasing power, uh, bankruptcies. Uh, we're getting to a point here where uh, the bulls are making a stand in ways they haven't in a couple of weeks. How do you explain that to people? Well, I, I think we're looking at yesterday's news. And so I, I share some of Diane's concerns. But I want to point out that back in the Great Recession, for example, um, the unemployment, uh, the, high of the, uh, the high of the jobs was at 146 on, on November of 2007. We didn't trust until two years later, and then we didn't get all those jobs back until 2014. So it took nearly seven years after the first peak and nearly five years after the trough to get all the jobs back. But did that mean you didn't want to own the market? And so to me, the, the, the market is more reflecting the fact that we're beginning to climb out of the economic valley. Uh, it's going to be uneven. It's going to depend upon how the virus proceeds. But we are starting to climb out, and that's what the market's looking at. It's looking forward and suggesting that perhaps as we climb out of the economic valley, uh, better days are ahead from the standpoint of uh, employment numbers, better days are ahead from the standpoint of GDP, and we don't have to recoup all of that for uh, the market to move higher. And so that would be point one. Point two I'd make is that I do think the, the market does reflect the current reality. You have a few stocks that have held up the S&P 500, so they've largely been – uh, virus proof. Think of the fangs, for example. The other side of the equation, the more economically sensitive ones, they're actually down 24, 25, 30 percent. And so I do think there's reality being reflected in the markets. And I think that's a comment that people are making that I think they're kind of missing the, the boat about what's happened in the market. And so that's where I think the differences are. And as the economy recovers, I do think those other names will continue to do better.